So, we are quickly coming to a close on this series in John. Uh, it's exciting to kind of wrap it up, but it's kind of sad too. I've really loved this journey through John together. And we're going to spend our last three weeks in John chapter 17, which is this, this big high priestly prayer that Jesus prays. And we're going to kind of consider what he's praying. And what we'll see in so many ways is that it actually does an incredible job of summarizing the whole Gospel of John, what Jesus came to do and uh, what he hopes is, well, hopes in his human sense, but the intended purpose of, uh, of the Christ event, of his ministry, his death, resurrection, uh, and, and vindication, ascension into heaven, these things. So, this morning, if you have copy the Scriptures, you can turn to John chapter 17. We're only going to deal with the first five verses and kind of ask ourselves the question, very simple, what is Jesus praying for and why? Okay, John 17, 1 through 5. This is what John writes. After Jesus said this, uh, so we're talking about this big discourse we've been reading, right? John 14, 15, 16. So after Jesus said that, He looked up toward heaven and he began to pray. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given to him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. The Word of God for the people of God. Okay. So let's talk about the context of this prayer super quick. uh, And it kind of sets us up for these next three weeks. I said to you earlier, it starts this chapter, it says, after he had said these things. So that whole discourse that we've been doing after Easter, John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus is centrally telling disciples, I'm going away, and you're not coming with. I'm going, you're staying, which is kind of crazy news for the disciples, and they're processing it, and they're asking questions, and Jesus is giving some clear answers, some vague answers, he's going to let the cross and the resurrection speak for itself uh, after the fact. Uh, So he gives them this whole thing. And you remember we've tried to say that the the thing Jesus called them to, how do you live in a moment where Jesus is not physically present, but you are here? Uh, It's so relevant for us because that's our experience as Christians. And the answer that we've been trying to push for is this idea of intimacy with God. Remain in Jesus. Dwell in Him. Abide in Him. Cultivate an intimacy with Him. And a big part of that is obeying His commands and this kind of this cyclical reality. Even though in the world, uh, doing that is going to bring some kind of resistance. If you stay in God, it's the key to experiencing the things that Jesus has brought. So now, what's going to happen is, like any good preacher, if you've been going to church for any length of time, you know this tends to happen, doesn't it? Like any good preacher who feels like the audience needs just one more emphasize, it's the final prayer where you deliver the summary of your sermon, isn't it? If you preachers do that, you're like, yeah, you do that, Adam. Uh, And so this is what Jesus is in essence at some level doing here. So contextually, 14, 15, and 16 have all kinds of importance for understanding this. But did you notice the physical context? After Jesus said these things, he lifted his eyes to the heavens and began praying. So I think we have to assume that this is a very public prayer, right? Almost all the other times when we hear hear about Jesus praying, it says he went off alone with the Father and prayed. He went up on a mountain to pray. And it's telling then that we don't get the contents of those prayers, do we? Because there was no one there to hear them. But contextually, we have this recorded because the disciples were right there. This was a very public prayer because this prayer was not just 
uh, Jesus communing with God, though it was, it was also Jesus instructing the disciples, both in how to pray and in also what he was longing for in and through them. So, today we're just going to talk about one big idea of what Jesus prays for. And you don't have to be um, an English grammarian to understand that when a word gets repeated about a million times in five verses, it's probably going to be pretty central to what's going on, right? So what was the word? Glory, glorify, glory, glorify, glory, glorify this, glorify that, glorify these things, right? His whole prayer in this beginning section is about glory. Specifically, and this is interesting, he's asking the Father to glorify himself. Jesus is asking to be glorified. Now, this is really important to try to process and understand exactly what he's praying for. And to do that, we sort of need to pick up at verse 5 and and verse 1 and 2 and kind of smush them together just a little bit. Because he asks, Lord, glorify, the hour has come, glorify the Son. Father, glorify your Son. And at the end says, glorify me as I was before the foundation of the earth. So we get this picture of what's happening here in the whole Jesus event that John has told in his gospel, isn't it? Do you remember John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word for John? It's Jesus, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through the Word. This is a picture of Jesus before creation, lifted high at the status of full divinity. Do you see it? But we get 15 or so verses into John, and what does it say about the Word? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you have this glorified status of Jesus that becomes regular human, right? And so we process that a little bit in in our theologizing, and and it's what we call, uh, big words here, the hypostatic union of Jesus. What do we mean by that? Well, Christians, we believe that Jesus was both fully God and fully human. But the Apostle Paul helps us process this a little bit when he quotes the ancient hymn in Philippians chapter 2 where it says that Jesus set aside his divinity for a time and took on the form of humanity. So There's this sense of Jesus allowing himself to be lowered. It's not... Uh, a, a, a ceasing to be divine, but a willingly setting, setting aside of it in order to enter into this world to accomplish something significant, right? which is to deal with the problem of sin and death, which has corrupted all of creation from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to that moment. If we're going to deal with sin and death, John knows we've got to start before Genesis 3, doesn't he? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We can look to Him for possible hope. But in order to deal with it, He had to become human, to step out of the comforts and the loftiness and the glory of heaven into the everyday schmucky uh, nonsense of our lives, right? I don't mean to demean your lives, but let's be honest, right? It's not the glories of heaven, is it? Like, you might have a wonderful life. I'm not dismissing that in any way, but it is at least a few steps down from the glories of heaven, right? Jesus willingly enters into this so that he can deal with the problem of sin and death, and now he's praying that God will return him to the glory that he had before his incarnation. That's what this prayer is about. Does it make sense? So we need to understand this word glory just a little bit. The word glory uh, really is, because these are Jewish people who are talking, it's rooted in, in uh, the, the Hebrew concept of glory. The word is kavod. It, me- it means weight, right? A value, significance, heaviness. When I was a kid, um, we lived in this development, and right across the, the semi-big two-lane road that ran through our town and uh, was a a creamery, Meadowbrook Farms. And um, 
typically on a Friday or a Saturday night, my dad and my mom and my sisters and I would get up and we'd go over our house, go up the street to the main drag, 422, if you know Berks County at all. And we look left and we look right and there weren't cars coming and we'd run across the road and we'd go in and we would get an ice cream cone with two heaping scoops on it, right? And in those days, I was a mint chocolate chip connoisseur. And so I craved this reality. And in Meadowbrook Farms in, I don't know, 1986 or whatever time it was, it probably cost a nickel, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't that cheap. But, but it was this inexpensive kind of ice cream cone. These days, if you go to a creamery, do you know what they do? You ever seen this? They actually scoop out your big two scoops, and then they sit the cone in this weird holder, and it's on a scale. Have you seen this happen before? They're weighing your ice cream cone to know how much to charge you. This is what our world has come, right? But this is kavod, isn't it? It's not just every two ice cream scoops are the same. It's what is the actual weight to find the true value. Does it make sense? And the, the thing is that the more weighty thing is the more valuable thing. Therefore, to glorify something is to to ascribe to it a higher weight than other things, a higher value than other things, to return Jesus above humanity. But specifically, what is he asking for in this moment? Because he starts his whole prayer by saying a weird phrase, right? The hour has come. Now, we've been reading through John uh, for several months now, and this phrase has showed up a bunch, just not like this. Up till this point, it has always been the hour has not yet come. Now things have changed. The hour has come. What is the hour referring to? It's referring to the cross all along, right? To Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. So when Jesus is praying this prayer, he has the cross front of mind. We know very well it's going to happen the next day, right? This is his prayer that he's praying Uh, in this place. He's staring right at the cross and asking God to glorify him. Think about this with me very logically and very humanly. Way too often when we read these earthly stories of Jesus, we simply ascribe to him his divinity. Don't ever stop doing that. (laughs) The minute we think Jesus is anything less than fully divine, we are considered heretics and rightly so. But I would suggest to you, the minute we stop considering the earthly Jesus anything less than fully human, we have also entered into the gray area of heresy. And So process this with me uh, as Jesus, as a human, wrestling through this moment, knowing that it has all been leading up to this moment of laying down his life. And in his humanity, don't you think at some level he's saying, okay, I'm doing my part. You come through for me, Father. This is a prayer for resurrection, friends. Jesus is praying. I know the cross is in front of me. In other Gospels, we know He says, hey, if there's any other way, let's go plan B. Okay, there's not any other way. We're going for it. Glorify me. Right? Jesus is praying for resurrection. The miraculous rise of life, even in the face of of death. It's the very thing we pray for every time we ask God to intervene in our life. We have the truth of Jesus' resurrection to base it on. Jesus was pioneering something brand new and making it possible. Look at the intimacy of this prayer. Father, glorify Your Son. Jesus is always talking like this. But you know there's a prayer or at least a Maybe we wouldn't even call it a prayer, but a, a communication to God where He doesn't talk like this. Do you know where it happens? It happens on the cross, doesn't it? There He says, God, why have You forsaken Me? Intimacy is broken because the weight of sin is heaped on Him. And in essence, in those moments, the Father turns away from Him as He takes on the sin and death of the world. Jesus, before the cross, 
is clinging to the intimacy that he knows is true to persevere through the trial of the moment, believing fully that the intimacy with the Father is what will carry him through. Does this make sense? This is the prayer that Jesus is praying. Father, glorify your Son. Just the next day, the religious leaders, the opposing Romans, the people, the devil himself and the agencies of the world are going to lift Jesus up. But for his shame. And Jesus is praying, Father, you lift me up for your glory. Isn't that amazing that Jesus says, glorify me, but why does he pray that? Because he knows that that is what will ultimately glorify the Father. Fascinating. By the way, that's why we can't always just mimic Jesus' prayer. <laughs> right? We can't say, well, Jesus prayed glorify me, so we should just go home and be like, Father, glorify me in this moment. No. It's what glorifies God. And Jesus knows in this moment that it's the resurrection is the vindication of the sacrifice of Jesus. It's the thing that will defeat sin and death. Without the resurrection, the cross is a lost cause. But God is fully glorified when God is put on display for who He truly is. When the world can see the weight and the value of God. And we see that in God's ability to rescue and redeem the world from its own destruction. The cross is only a heroic what might have been without the resurrection. Jesus says, Father, glorify Me. But Jesus' eyes, while fully on the Father, are also peering (laughs) at all of His disciples. Right? By the way, in the first century world of Jesus, people prayed a little bit more like this than they did like this. So, Do with that what you want, right? I don't know why we do this. I guess because we feel like we might do weird things with our hands when we pray. I don't know. We close our eyes because we might be distracted. There's nothing wrong with it. There's good, you know, but we we see very clearly here Jesus lifted his eyes to the heavens. He's praying like this. But you see this sense where he's looking at God, but he also can kind of see the surroundings (laughs) around him. And this is ultimately to glorify God, but it's also to bring hope to his disciples. Because without the resurrection, the cross is just a heroic what might have been story. And so the second thing he prays for, though underneath his personal glory, is for eternal life to be realized by all who have been given to him by the Father. Simple question, right? They used to do catechisms. Many denominations still do catechisms. Catechisms where you would ask a theological question and there would be a, a response that we would that the people would learn in response to it. It's a way of learning basic Christian theology. So a question like that could be, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? And part of the answer is, so that he might afford eternal life to any who would come to him. It's interesting, isn't it, that this verse says that Jesus says, Father, you have, a given, you have given me authority, the Greek word exuthia, like rule and reign, dominion over all these people. That's a word we don't look at. Like, when do we hear the word authority? When someone is about to punish, right? We hear the word authority when someone's about to deliver a judgment. We hear the word authority when someone's about to critique or criticize or condemn. And yet, here we hear the word authority when someone is about to self-sacrificially reach out in love to rescue. Isn't this fascinating? That Jesus looks on what He has authority over and its condition breaks His heart and moves Him in love to the point of ultimate sacrifice so that it might be restored. That's what Jesus thinks about you. That's the love that moves him. That's the love that moves him to offer eternal life. So we ask the question, 
what is eternal life? And some of you, you've been in the church for a long period of time. You're like, I know the answer to that. It means when we die, we live forever. And I say to you, very good. You're a quarter of the way there, right? <laughs> Absolutely true. Don't ever dismiss the truth of that. The New Testament writers go on regularly to proclaim the hope of life after death. That the moment a believer dies, we are in the presence of Christ. What a glory that is. But if that's all eternal life is, is living forever, then we have really missed things. Because that's not at all what Jesus says that it is. Jesus says that eternal life is both quantity and quality. That it's not just about how long life extends, but it's the kind of experience of life that you are afforded. Ever ask yourself a question when you're reading this prayer before? Why does he stop to define terms in the middle of a prayer to the Father? Right? But once again, it's a public prayer and it's a teaching moment. Jesus knows what eternal life is. He doesn't have to stop to define terms in verse 3 of the beginning of his prayer here, but he does. He says, and now this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He even talks about himself in the third person, right? That's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Jesus is showing us the truth of the quality of eternal life, that it is equal to a knowledge of God. We spend lots of time talking about this, so I won't belabor the point. The word is gnosko here, not oida, right? It's the word that means relational knowing. It's the talking about close bonds, a connection, knowing something up close and personal, in and out, the presence of physically being with and connected to the fullness of that reality. Jesus says that that's what eternal life actually is, full and unabated access to God the Father, that He is for you and not against you, that you're fully into His family, and that you have access to all of those things. So how do we get eternal life then? Well, Jesus says, you know the only true God. Do something, uh, I've often heard people say, the Bible teaches that there's only one God. And again, I would say that's your 50% of the way there. The Bible actually teaches that there's only one true God. So you might say, well, yeah, that's what I meant. Capital G God. Okay, fine. But let's not be naive to the fact that God is well aware, as we ought to be, that there is a multitude of little g gods out there that we try to elevate. And when we do, they rob us of the quality of eternal life. Does it make sense? It's why we will feel that once and for all most fully in, the, the, in heaven when we're with God in the new creation in the new heavens with the Father. But it's what robs it from us in the now. Eternal life is accessible to you both in quantity someday and in quality then and now because you have become aware of your personal need for it. Right? Someone offers you eternal life, what they're also telling you is what you currently have is not <laughs> eternal life. Right? And it's the acknowledgement of God as the only true God, the renouncing of other gods, and then it's the knowing of Jesus as the means by which we can enter into that true life. Now listen, for some of you who are here this morning or who are listening to this now or will listen to this a little bit later on, you have not had an experience of eternal life. Maybe you've sat in the church for lengths of time, but all of this has just been kind of factual. Yeah, this is what Christians believe. I'm a Christian, so yeah. But it's not personal for you. There needs to be a moment of true surrender. A moment of true understanding of who you are. A moment of true reckoning with who God is. And then a moment of fully grasping 
for what, who Jesus is and what He has done. Without that, eternal life will, will be evasive for you. You will be unable to grab hold of it. For others of you, eternal life is something you have already taken hold of. But for many of us as Christians, we live in what I would like to call a someday experience of eternal life. It's like, yeah, I'm going to have eternal life someday. And I say, wow, that's incredible. Me too. But if it's eternal, then why does it need a starting date? (laughs) Right? Jesus, in announcing the connection of eternal life with His glorification, has said, the moment the resurrection was enacted, therefore eternal life was also enacted in that moment. It's available to you just as much now as it will be then. Much easier to grab hold of then than it is now. So this question is what I want to leave you with. How then do we take hold of of eternal life in the now? How do we not just get by? How do we not just cross our fingers and hope that we make it? How do we endure the struggle of this world? How do we, remember the context, live in a world remaining in Jesus even though He's not physically present with us? The answer is a now eternal life. Not just a then eternal life. And the Apostle Paul will go on to show us that we access the now eternal life in the very same way we have access the then eternal life. It just requires us to day by day, moment by moment, keep pursuing it. Eternal life is found when you are honest about yourself the truth of your earthly struggle. It's found when you look at God as the only true God. You are willing to admit we live in a pluralistic world, right? We used to try to believe in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. There's no such thing as atheism. It's nonsense. We are living in a religiously pluralistic world. We just don't tend to call the things we serve gods. We call them other things. And all of us serve other gods. It's why we don't experience eternal life. It's why we don't experience the depth of intimacy with the Father that Jesus did on earth. Or that He says is available to us, but it seems fleeting and far away and challenging. It's why when we pray, it feels like sometimes God is distant. It's why the struggles of the life tend to overwhelm and, and, and crowd us in. And when we look at our life and see religious pluralism, it should move us to grab for Jesus, who's the only means to overcome that brokenness. And when we see and relish the love of Jesus, that He had authority over us, looks at us, all of us, and says, look at all of these gods. Money, vocation, status, significance, family, kids. Like, plenty of good things, but we've, you know, we've weighed them more in the ice cream cone at the creamery than God, you know? He has authority to do whatever He wants, and He says... My heart is so broken for them that I will lay down my life and I will pray on the heels of laying down my life, Father, glorify me. Make it possible for them to overcome the grip and the trap of sin and death. You say, Adam, that's like, okay, fine. But it's so esoteric. It's so out there. It's so abstract. How do we do it? Here's the best way I know how. And here's what I think Jesus is instructing his disciples in this prayer. The key is what? What's that word that kept getting repeated all the time in these five verses? 
key is glory. To be regularly asking yourself, what weighs the most in my life right now? What holds the value? To use language that I tend to like to use, where am I finding my identity? Or to use language that Jesus might be using in this moment, where am I looking to for the real experience of life? The full sense of what it means to be human. To be known and needed and affirmed and significant and accepted and secure. All these things that our souls long for. The answer to those questions is your God. And the more you transfer... (laughs) I want to stop using the ice cream illustration, but I kind of can't. (laughs) The more you transfer ice cream into the right cone, the more it changes the experience of your life. But here's the thing, and I want you to know this, church. And this is why we're not going to end with an altar call and a prayer moment, whatever, but if God's moving you, I want you to do what you need to do. But it's not a once and done. It just isn't. It's not a moment where you come and say, okay, I'm doing it. Great. You're going to need to do it again in an hour. And you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. That's why retreats are wonderful, but they teach us the wrong thing sometimes, right? You have this big moment and everything changes, and then you go back to work on Monday. <laughs> the Christian path of sanctification is hard work. That's why if the resurrection isn't true, we're hopeless. But the resurrection is true, and therefore you know that there is resurrection defeat over the traps of sin and death, over the grips of little G gods that points us to big G God, and so you grapple every single day with what you're valuing. And you ask the question, what would it mean in this moment to glorify God? To raise the true God in my life above all the other gods? You can't just ask that question in a single hypothetical way. You have to ask it in every little minuscule section of your life, don't you? Because we are experts at compartmentalization, right? Right now, here we are sitting in this religious space, and for many of us, there's nothing more important than God. (laughs) But what about the other aspect of your life? What about your work? What about your family life? What about the broken parts of you? All these things. So I want to give you I want, to give, I want to be honest with you about the wrestle, but I want to give you hope to keep wrestling because it's exactly what this prayer is all about. Don't you see? That Jesus in His humanity is saying, God, could there be resurrection where there is defeat? And He knows that it's true, and so He's willing to give Himself to it. And at the same time saying, oh, by the way, disciples, this is the thing that guarantees eternal life. So live like this. Be willing to crucify yourself to the lower G gods so that you can experience the intimacy of the glorification of the one true God. It will change your life. Let me give you a caveat, moment by moment. (laughs) Not one big broad stroke, and it's all different. Jesus, when he prays, is teaching. And he's giving us insight into what true life really looks like. Can you pray with me? Jesus, thank You for giving us access to this incredible prayer. Thanks for showing us Your humanity. Thanks for taking on humanity. Thanks for taking on our brokenness, our pain, our suffering, our sickness, our death. We know that in this earth, You haven't guaranteed us absence of the pain of any of those things. But you have promised us eternal life. That does mean at the end of our days, the fullness of life is assured. But it also means that even in the midst 
of the ups and downs of this world, we have unabated access to God if we would see Him as the one true God. God, might it be true of us as a church that increasingly we are characterized by intimacy with the Father. Truly knowing Him, not just knowing about Him. God, for my friends who are here who just know about God, they've, it's never been a personal thing where they've really felt the wrestle of their own sin and seen God for who He is. W- would, you, would you persistently chase after their heart until they relent? And for the rest of us, would you keep chasing after our hearts so that we keep relenting? So that we might be all that you've created us to be for your glory. I pray it in your holy name. Amen. Church, as we finish, let's stand and we'll sing together.